Hello and a very warm welcome to this midweek service from St Mary's Church Withal. I'm Reverend Manda Featherstone, the Vicar of St Mary's. The suggestion is that uh, you engage with this service on a Wednesday at 11.30. But whatever time and whatever day you join in, we want this to be a time when we engage with God, to worship him, to lift our prayers before him, to open his word and hear him speak. So let us hold a moment of quiet as we recognise God's presence with us. Some words will come up on the screen and you're invited to join in with the words of a bold type. O oh Lord, open our lips and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. An opening prayer. Awaken us, Lord, to your light. Open our eyes to your presence. Awaken us, Lord, to your love. Open our hearts to your indwelling. Awaken us, Lord, to your life. Open our minds to your abiding. Awaken us, Lord, to your purpose. Open our wills to your guiding. And as we are awakened to the presence of the Lord, we are also awakened to his holiness and therefore also to our sinfulness, the things that we get wrong and the poor decisions we make. And so we can come to our confession knowing that God is faithful and will forgive us. A moment to consider what it is you want to confess today. God, our Father, we come to you now in sorrow for our sin, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For behaving just as we wish without thinking of you. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. May Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring you his pardon and his peace, now and forever. Amen. And now let us uh, open and hear God's word. Before we turn to God's word, we have our special prayer for today, which is called the Collect. For those who aren't sure what a collect means, a brief word. These are beautiful prayers written many centuries ago and have been used ever since for the whole Christian church so that the entire church is able to pray together wherever they are, scattered throughout the world. Some are weekly, some are daily, 
They are often re relevant to a particular season or occasion, and in each one there are four parts. First, they acknowledge that as a Christian church worldwide, we are all praying to the one and only God, the creator of heaven and earth. We recognise that he is holy and almighty, and that to truly know him is to have everlasting life. Second comes a petition or a request to God. The request is practical and it recognises that God alone is the source of our lives and all knowledge. Third, these prayers are offered to God through Jesus Christ our Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit, therefore recognising the Trinity. One God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And finally comes the Amen, which is the voice of the whole church agreeing with the leader because Amen means so be it, we agree with you. So let us pray. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we could desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. I thought it would be interesting to explain the collect because when I read it and the reading for today, which I'm going to read in a minute, there are so many features in common. See what you think. So our reading for today is from 1 Chronicles, um, chapter 16 and verses 23 to 26. And this is what it says. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among all people. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendour and majesty are before him, strength and joy in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then the trees of the forest will sing. They will sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Cry out, save us, O God our Saviour, Gather us and deliver us from the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name, that we may glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. So this reading really is a, is a, a wonderful shout of praise to God from King David in Old Testament times. He praises God because he knows that he leads him in everything that he does, that he's always at his side and that he shows him um, how to lead God's people Israel because that's what he called David to do. 
The contents of this reading became a song or a psalm, if you like, used by King David's worship leaders. We see it in Psalms 105 and 106, and it's just bursting with David's unbridled joy. How fitting then is this reading to be the second in our series on the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Val spoke last week about the first fruit of the Spirit, love, and now we consider the second, joy. But first a reminder that all of the fruits, all nine of the fruits or results of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us are common to everyone who has committed their lives to Jesus. Not only one or two, but every one of them. Because when we come to know Jesus, when we are included into the Christian faith, God imparts to us his spirit. Paul says, having believed, the seal of the Holy Spirit is given to us as a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance. There's a suggestion of so much more to come. Well, on reading, the th first thought that came to my mind was, well, what's the difference between joy and happiness? So I worked that through. I guess we all know that it's very easy to be happy when everything in our lives is going well. But as Christians, we must know that it is also possible when we are beset by things that make us unhappy, still to be able to experience that deep and calming joy of our salvation in Jesus, which we can never deny. We say things like, I just know. And that's possible for us because we know that that deep joy comes from the spirit of Jesus living within us. It's not a human thing and that it will never, ever change. And the second thought I had was, oh, OK, I do know that joy, I do, for sure. But does it show? Do the fruits of the spirit shine out of me as God would want? And is the love of God evident in my behaviour? Surely this should be an essential in the life of all followers of Jesus, that the fruits of the Spirit will be seen in us and that people will ask, what is it that's different about you? How can you love those people? How can you love everyone? And how can you trust God in your life and praise him joyfully when such bad stuff is happening to you? It seems to me that many of the things that we depend upon to bring us happen, happiness in this life can be lost. Some over time, others in a moment. So while we must always be grateful for those things, we must hold them lightly. Also, there are sometimes things that give us pleasure and make us happy for a while, but turn out not to be so good for us then maybe they need to be discarded with God's help so that we are free of them. But the fruits of the Spirit which God has poured out on Jesus' followers can never, never, never be lost because they are all the characteristics of God's personality, of God himself, of Jesus as we know him from Scripture and as we know him in our relationships with him. It's easier to be a Christian the further you go. <laughs> as we grow in our faith, as we recognise these fruits of the Spirit bursting inside us and outside of us, we gradually become more like Jesus because we are taking into ourselves the very character of Jesus. How amazing is that? It's like by giving ourselves to God, we have given permission to him to make us into little Christ. And if we live as God asks us to, loving him above all else, loving him first, then we will always experience these precious qualities. Yes, first love and now true joy that we see and hear King David expressing in our reading. The context is about the Ark of the Covenant, which I think I was talking about the other week. The Ark of the Covenant had been captured by those dreadful Philistines which were always warring against Israel. 
continual enemies of God's people. It was stolen about a thousand years before originally and several times it was moved from one place to another and people found that it was a threat to have it near them. It was, it was full of some kind of power which they couldn't explain. But now finally King David had established himself in Jerusalem, known at that time the city of David. And the people of God were pretty well established there and for a time there was peace. So King David went about constructing a huge tent in which to house the Ark of God. When the tent was ready, he and a great retinue went to bring the Ark out of the Philistines possession to its rightful place on Mount Zion amongst his people. And as they made their long journey back, the procession halted every few miles, while the priests and the Levites, accompanied by David, made sacrifices of thanks to God, and the musicians led the people in joyful worship. And when at last the ark came to rest in its rightful place among God's people, King David's joy knew no bounds. We can read earlier in this chapter, do read it, that he threw off his outer robe and danced unashamedly in front of all the people at the ark's arrival. It must have been some party. When his wife showed her disapproval of his undignified behaviour, David didn't care. He said that he was happy to be even more undignified than that in order to show his delight and joy in serving his God. He was satisfied because he knew that he had done well. So the celebrations continued until finally David the king gave gifts of food to all of the families and blessed them to go to their homes and to rest in peace at last. Now those Philistines just like all surrounding nations, worshipped many gods of silver and gold and any old rubbish and they carried them with them when they went to war because they thought that the idols with them would make them successful. And I, I, maybe that's why they stole the ark. The mistake they made was that they counted it as merely another idol. They had wrongly thought that having that in their possession would guarantee them success in war because they had seen that to be true of King David's conquests. But what they didn't understand was that the ark was merely a symbol of God's presence. It wasn't to be worshipped as a god in itself because it had no power in itself. When Israel went to war headed up by, by King David, it was on God's orders, not his own. And it was not the symbol of their God, the Ark, that gave them success, but God's very real presence with them in their battle. That's like having the Holy Spirit with them. David's song or psalm proclaims firstly our Father as the one and only Almighty God in heaven, who is and always will be the one who's in charge. He gives all the praise and glory to him after obedient work well done. Then it summons all creation to come together to honour and to praise God for his great love and perfect holiness and splendour. It asks for Israel's protection from the antagonistic foreign powers and it prays for all people that they will come to know God as David did, as we do. It recognises God as the judge who one day in his good time will come to judge the whole earth and every person who has ever lived. And it ends in thanks and praise to the God whose love, as Val said last week, will endure for all time for all of his children. Now, isn't that a bit like our colleague? So what about us? What does it mean to you and I to be full of joy, to live in joy, 
to be expressing our joy to those around us? And is our love evident to all? Do we know for sure that we are filled with the Holy Spirit? Do we know the difference between human happiness and that deep, satisfying joy of knowing Jesus? Do the fruits of the Holy Spirit show in our lives and in our relationship with others? And if there are any no's to these questions, what are we going to do about it? Could be that there are things in our lives that make us happy for a while, but we know that they hamper our growth as Christians. We want to be free. King David himself had been in that place. He was only human after all. So before God, he confessed his sins and God forgave him and restored him and he used him mightily. Maybe we all need to do something about that. And how do we serve God? Does each of us know, as David knew, what he's calling us to do? And if so, are we joyful as David was when we know we have served him well, even if it's hard? Can we sense his pleasure and his peace as David did with a job well done? So then, we are free to praise God for the fruit of his spirit in our lives with joyous abandon, as King David did, not caring a bit if we are considered fools for his sake. And we can joyfully shout out together with all of God's people, including those early Israelites, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. Praise the Lord. We now turn to our creed, an opportunity to declare our faith in God. This creed is in question form and allows you to respond with gusto, to declare your faith. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Having declared our faith in the one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, let us turn to him now in prayer. For the structure of our prayers, we're going to use a picture of a footprint and I'm going to guide us uh, to look at what that may conjure up and then leave a moment for your own prayers and then invite you to respond after I say, Lord, in your mercy, respond, hear our prayer. Looking at the footprint, we're aware that footprints give us something to follow something to guide us. So Lord, we turn to you now and ask that you guide us as individuals where there might be decisions to make or where there might be the factors of following Jesus and his model. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Looking at the footprint, we ask for God's guidance for us as the Church of St Mary's as lockdown eases as we make our responses.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we look at the footprint, we're aware of that phrase, the carbon footprint and the imprint we make upon the world. Let us pray that we would be good stewards and look after God's creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we look at the footprint, let us be aware of bare feet today and let us pray for those who are in poverty and are the most vulnerable in this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. There's a popular Christian poem called Footprints in the Sand. The writer writes about two pairs of footprints together as Jesus walks along with us, but then asks, but why in this part is there one set of footprints? And in the poem, the reply comes, that's when I carried you. Let us pray now for all who need to be carried by Jesus today because of the struggles, challenges and difficulties they face. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So Lord Jesus, we pray that we would know you walking ahead of us, being our guide. That we would know you walking beside us, supporting us and conversing with us. And Lord Jesus, we pray we would know you walking behind us, being our protector and our shield. We lift all our prayers in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. And now let us say the Lord's Prayer together in its traditional form. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. A moment of quiet as we reflect on all we have heard and prayed and been prompted about during this service. And a final prayer for us to say together. Father, today fill me with the fruit of the Spirit. Help me to live by the Spirit. Guided by you, enable me to show to all those around me and each person I meet love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control through your spirit. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's been great to have you join this online service today. We have an uh, online service on Sundays as well as Wednesdays. Please do join us. But also if you want to get in touch at any point, please uh, visit our website www.withelchurch.net 
and uh, send us a message and I would love to be in contact with you if you would like that. Stay safe, be blessed.